Lucy, hello. It was lovely for you to be here today. Um, we're here to talk about Bookworm. We are. Yeah, yeah which is uh, partly a memoir, but also partly a love letter to children's books, I think. Do you agree? Well, I, I think so, yeah, just because my whole childhood was a love letter to children's book. I can't book books. I, can't, I couldn't write anything about my childhood without it being that way inclined. What with having no real friends or anything. <laughs> well, I think a lot of that, I mean, I'm, I'm a bookworm as well, um, appropriately enough, we're still towards so. stones, yeah, you'd, with, yeah. you would think. Um, and it, it occurred to me reading this book, which was just a joy because it was oh, like meeting lots of old friends um, and it was very familiar and I'm sure lots of people have the same experience. Um, but it struck me that outside of kind of friends and family, mm. um, books are often where you do feet, meet the first people you fall in love with and the first books you, I think they are the first things you fall in in love with if you're a real bookworm and that certainly seems to be true for, for you. I think that's right I mean certainly it was the first thing I really loved to do I mm. mean I liked television and all the rest of it we weren't a, we weren't a hippie family <laughs> that didn't have you know there's plenty of telly and everything else mm. like that but reading was just this thing I loved to do and then I you know as I grew up and needed to do and, and you know it's, it's like it's like the mo world's most um, benign addiction it's you know it's socially sanctioned. It gives you lots of benefits instead of destroying you. But it is an addiction for a a true bookworm. And there's lots of ways to be a keen reader without going the full <laughs> the full Monty as I am and do and will continue to be. But yeah, it was the first thing I loved to do. And of course, the characters you meet are the first people, mm. and they often, yeah, especially as a child, they take on just as much reality as as real people mm. in your life the first people you s you really like and and love but you start right at the very beginning with the very first books mm. that you encountered and it runs right the way through um from school stories um you've got send up where the wild things are yeah. um narnia right the way through to school stories in a blighton and of course. judy bloom mm -hmm. the great sweet valley judy bloom. and great, sweet Bo great yes i interviewed judy bloom in this shop actually oh wow yeah, when I, a few years ago and it was basically it was a wonderful event she was great and everything but by the end of course it was just full of uh, it was just a room full of 30 something women crying <laughs> <laughs> i love you please sign book. she's like yes of course and i made her sign two of my books beforehand i said and i gave it to mm. her and i said I said, I'm sorry to ask you to do two, um, but I couldn't decide between them. I didn't want one to be left out. I've, I understand. I understand. But that's the thing. I'm I, mental. Th but I, that's the thing. I think if you if you are somebody who has had that love affair with books that started young, you do understand that there's a kind of language yeah. to it that you, people speak to each other, and it and it makes it's sense. It's lovely. I've done a few events already so far, and um, it's lovely to be in a room. Full of, you know, you f I feel like at the age of 43, I finally f found my tribe <laughs> by writing this book. We're all, you know, and no one wants to talk too much. They want to get back to reading, but we're all just, it's just nice to be there and know each other <laughs> exists, and then we part ways. And yeah, like <laughs> get back to the real business yeah, of, yeah. The, of getting ahead That's why I never belonged to the puffing club, you see. I thought it was a bit of a waste of yeah, good reading time. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't belong to any, any, any book clubs. And um, it's funny you s should mention Sweet Valley High because that took me right back to um, uh, Broomhill Library in Sheffield. And um, and the fact that you were allowed to take ten books out. And my wow. uh, my brother would go to his um, his to play football, and um, and I would have to go along ostensibly to to show moral support. Ha, as if. Yeah. Um, and and I would be able to take my library books and sit in the car and wow. read them. Um, but I was only allowed to have up to five Sweet Valley High books oh. because they were not considered no, proper absolutely. books. And yeah. I had to have five proper books that went along with it but you're quite that's not a bad balance <laughs> no it's very fair. It was, i thought it was quite fair, fair although i still you know and i think also it was probably to to stop me from racing through them quite as quickly so that i were more you could you could do them in half an hour yeah um, back in the day yeah but I'm you're interrupted but you're quite keen that that children should be allowed to read what they like um yeah i think especially especially in this day and age if, given how many other distractions there are um i i li i cannot think of a of a book it does you more harm to read than not to read mm. i would possibly make an exception for twilight yes. when getting on, but <laughs> you know short of that and even twilight i mean it's not an instruction manual and i think i think teenagers and um, or younger than teenagers do understand that but um yes because as i was going along and writing bookworm there were so many times when i th when i realized i got the weirdest things out of the oddest moments of books mm. like in um Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim, uh, the wise rat uh, who's been, you know, laboratory enhanced, 
Nicodemus says to Mrs. Frisby, um, if rats rule the world, there pro probably wouldn't be any skyscrapers because rats don't like to live above ground. But think of the endless subways below subways below subways there would have been. And it blew my tiny mm. nine-year-old mind. Go, oh my God, the world is essentially mutable. We built it because it's just for us. That's all, there's nothing special about it. It just suits us. Mm. And that's a really you know, good but odd thing to get out of a quite random and, you know, not Mrs. Frisbee is not a very sort of heavy book. It struck me as well that the, um, particularly with those early books, how important the illustrators are as well. And you, you, you do mention the, the, the illustrators quite, quite, a, quite a bit. Um, and do you think that we often forget that, how much of stories for young children are told through the pictures as well as through the, the, the words? We do, I think, and especially because obviously once you grow up, the people who write about books and who you read writing about books and then when you grow up yourself maybe and become a writer about books you are by your very nature a wordy person mm. more than a, an illustrator otherwise you'd have grown up to be an illustrator <laughs> da -da. Uh, so you do unless you are very conscious about it forget how important those those very early years probably because they're so distant as well but you forget if you're not a primarily visual person especially that they are the first things that teach you this, you know, e is for elephant, mm. and this is an elephant. You remember the elephant, not the e. Yeah, yeah, and, and in fact, I've uh, brought along some of my um, children's books, my very yeah. own Your battered own edi ed yeah. editions. You can't show this on film, but they do even smell like <laughs> old books. Um, and yeah, and so I brought along Richard Scarry, um, European well, word book, which I think was my parents' attempt to um, yeah. try and teach me some 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 important things you. yeah and, and it, it's full of important things in, in in other languages that you need to know all the time like croquet yeah. um which is actually the same in all languages <laughs> apparently or at least in german and french and um, and also has i'm going to try and find the page uh rather disturbing you wouldn't get this now um picture of a pig, pig eating, eating beef i think beef. um they got any um, I haven't got pork up here. Uh, as, a, as a grace, uh, as a, yeah, just, <laughs> just, just, just to sort of, and you just think, well, well, you probably wouldn't get that now. But the Richard Scarry's illustrations really stuck in my yeah. my head. Um, probably more actually, even I mean, obviously this is a this is a language book, but more even than the sort of what they were telling me. Um, I got I, a complete Proustian rush when I was reading Richard Scarry for the first time to my son Alexander. Um, because I'd completely forgotten about Lowly Worm. <laughs> and then suddenly there he was, and the whole kind of years came rushing back to me, early years came rushing back to me, uh, just through this little Lowly Worm One. with his hat on. <laughs> it's like a tiny thing. And also I'd finally got the joke, Lowly Worm. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't make sense. It was a good day. <laughs> yeah. a good day. <laughs> well, yeah, there are, there are definitely things that coming... And actually that's something you talk about, is coming back to, to children's books, that there are things that you see as an adult that you don't mm -hmm. that you never saw as a as a child yeah. um, and that's there with certainly with Enid Blyton who um well yes you see like <laughs> both a lot more and a lot less in Enid Blyton yeah. than you do as a child it's a tricky business um, um but things like uh the fact that uh, Teddy Robinson is really funny and uh oh um the owl who's afraid of the dark mm -hmm. is very you know very dry very funny mm -hmm. sort of wit for five-year-olds or um, sowing the seeds for greater things yeah. later on. They're just they're hilarious. Yeah. And I think it's important as well that, I mean, there are lots of lessons that you learn just from the process of being of being a bookworm, that you, not even from the reading so much as from the choosing. I was thinking about that, that when, um, if you're lucky enough to be taken to a library or a, or a bookshop, it's the first place where you really have autonomy over making choices yeah. about what That's you want point, to read actually, yeah. and, and also then finding out things like, the people you want to be friends with, because you 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 read in books, characters, and you then think, okay, I, I, I <laughs> like people. I like people like you, and I really don't like people Where like is you. Where's my Sarah Croon? Life, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah. When it comes to Little Princess, I uh, I went through a stage of um, carrying an unlit candle up to bed, and uh, <laughs> and when asked what I was doing, I said solemnly, I am being an orphan, because. Um, that's what you do, obviously. <laughs> it's a universal orphan, orphan sign. Orphan sign, yeah, yeah, yeah. candle. And um, I also brought along um, Jill Murphy. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is the second one I th in the Worst Witch series. Yeah. You mentioned the Worst Witch. Um, and 
I want to talk about how, we were talking about how funny books are, because I think going back to Jill Murphy, what struck me is just how funny her, her books are. See, she's more slapstick and I, I leave Alexander to read these on his own. <laughs> <laughs> I'll read you Teddy Robinson, but, but I do, I still love them. They're so charming and, and, mm. and light and, and beautifully shaped. Yeah. And I had this edition as well, but I was a bit earlier and they didn't have a young puffin written across the top. Oh, all that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the, the editions of, of books are important and it, um, I was very lucky, I think, in, in being able to have some of my own books and therefore, you know, and they have my name written in them. Mm. And they were the first things I think that felt like mine. They really did belong to me. Yeah. And it's, and it's really important to a child that you can keep them and have the thing, the object, you know, because mm. we're all acquisitive little reactionary buggers, basically. <laughs> but, um, with books, yeah, they become a thing. You, you know, you learn to orientate yourself within your own personal book. There's a bend in this page here, and you, you know, you really get to know it as an object. And I think that's why children's publishing is held up so well, because although children like love screens and they don't really differentiate in terms of if they just want to read a story, mm -hmm. if they love something, they want to have it. They want yeah. to hold it. It's a very sort of primal, unsophisticated, instinctive mm -hmm. thing. Um, and I'm, I'm very glad of that. I would, I would hate to they, they get to they get to the age of twenty and go, oh my god, why did I never get buy any books? All everything is, yeah. My I, myself is in the cloud. I have no self. Yeah. No, and I, th I think that's. I'm possibly going too far, though. I doubt. <laughs> <laughs> It possibly wouldn't have been a generation growing up thinking that, but you know, no. they wouldn't have known. Maybe they wouldn't have known what they missed. But I think it, it is really important to have something that you, you know, that, that 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 act of putting your, you know, your name in something. It's not just. It's that saying that the story has gone from being abstract out there to mm. being something that is yours. You own it. It's me. yeah, and you've taken yeah. it kind of yeah to, to to. Also, your sister then can be suitably punished if she destroys or yes, damages. Yes, absolutely. Although I, my, I imagine. In my case, I'm quite lucky because my brother generally thought books were for piling things on or uh, using in construction. Yeah, no, so did my, my, my <laughs> sister refers to books as firewood. It's just not a family <laughs> joke, which you know it. Yeah. It's done her no harm at all. She can do anything. I mean, my sister's the most incredible, practical, um, able person in the world. <laughs> she flings a book over her shoulder <laughs> and she comes across it. Well, my brother has uh, managed to find audio books, so he, a, a lot mm. of his, he, he still loves stories, which is quite... I find mm. quite reassuring. Mm. So it's meant that recently we've, we've, we've bonded over, over books in a way that we never have yeah, before. It's an entirely right. new experience. But, um, and and I, I think also it's quite, you find, you, you're not, in the book, you're not always talking about books that you like as well. There are, there are books in, no, in mostly, here that you, but mostly, but there yeah. are some, we have to talk about Anne of Green Gables. Do we? Oh, <laughs> talk the to me about Anne of Green the Gables. The I get for Anne of Green Gables. <laughs> right. Ah, this will make my agent very happy because she is on your side. <laughs> all I'm saying, all I say, all I said to her was that the first time I read it, I couldn't stand her. <laughs> she seemed twee and sentimental and, oh, I love puff sleeves, oh, my hair is red <laughs> and I was a terrible burden. And I just didn't get it. It just didn't, I was a very literal, sturdy, boring child. Um, who'd had the whimsy battered out of me at an early age, and I didn't respond to it at all. I fling, flung it over my shoulder. Um, and then when I reread it at 20 something, I got it. But of course, by that stage, it's never going to become part of you. So now I like it and I admire it, and I've read it a couple mm. of times, but it is not part of me. I am not a foot-an, as they <laughs> call themselves. Do they? They do. Oh. Oh dear. Uncle, which is fine. You know, okay. But I'm not one. No. And I apologise for that. I got it wrong the first time. <laughs> well, move They're on. Worse than we'll Jane Austen <laughs> fans. Move on. Move on. I brought along my, my favourite famous five. That's your favourite. This oh, is my favourite. Mine was number three. Five go um, to Kirin Island. No, five run away together, it was called, wasn't it? Number three. Well, I actually preferred the adventure series. Um, and I think probably on 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 balance, okay, um, okay. Par partly because I, they they seem to go on, well they seem to go a bit further afield. You're talking about the, the sea of adventure. Sea, yeah, yeah, sea of it, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I I did like those, um, but I, I I was a bit thrown by Kiki every time. Well, I yes. Like, <laughs> I think I think a parrot's going too far. Actually, yeah, no. just, there's just something. <laughs> so, how many animals can we go through? Not in, um, not in home counties. It didn't happen. No, no. Didn't happen. But I, I, I particularly like this one because um, growing up on the edge of the Derbyshire moors, moors and fog was something that I was, I was very familiar with. It's real. Um, 
Um, so, again, I thought those those two things still happened in the past. <laughs> no, disappeared. no, definitely not. They fetched the patient little skewbald who came out gladly. He no longer, longer limped and his rest seemed to have done him good. He went off at a good pace with Sniffer. I'm oh, good, good. Uh, the last George heard of him was a very loud sniff indeed. I mean, it's... It, it's but it, I just loved it. I mean, I just... I was so happy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Two years, just on the basis of... And I don't 21 adventures alone, you know, barely a day's work for her. So. And, 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 and Blighton is problematic, pe you know, for people. I believe that's the word of the day. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, and I, and you write about this, I, I was never aware when I was reading it. I mean, why would I be mm. that there was anything? She was writing for us. Yeah, yeah it, was, exactly. it was just, um, but it, I mean, it, it, it is something that you, you, that you, you write about that I think is really important about the, needing to have mirrors for ourselves in, in, in the books that we encounter, particularly as, as children. And I did, do you want to talk about that a bit? Well, I was talking in the book about um, the different types of censorship she's been, Blyton's been subjected to over mm. the years and how, you know, I, I think there's a much better case for, for taking out some of the, the racist overtones mm. and undertones. Um, than there is for, say, changing the vocabulary that yeah. they tried to do a few years ago by changing school tunic to school uniform and that kind of thing, which yeah. just removes a sense of period mm. and, and stops children having to make those little leaps to, yeah. you know, learning new words. For me, a sense of period um, is a good thing, but it doesn't uh, counteract the harm that's done by a child of colour mm. reading that and, and discovering that they're basically dirty, swarthy and, you know, synonymous with whatever. Mm. Um, negative words she comes up with. So I think I can cope with that kind of thing being expunged quite happily. Yeah. But the, I, I find the, the sexism thing is more tricky for me. And obviously that was, that was the one thing I did notice a bit that obviously Anne is always left behind to yeah. <laughs> bump for the bracken and, and make tea for five on a tiny oil stove. But I just thought that was because she was a drip, not because she was a girl. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it seems more ridiculous to, to girls these days or if it just actually does make that drip of in your consciousness yeah. that says oh I'm not I'm not as good as a boy I'm not, I don't know yeah and I don't know either and I um, I was I was really trying to sort of think about it and think whether but uh, like you I don't think I was ever I wasn't conscious of, of reading books and thinking I can't do this because and mm. you know and, and perhaps that was because it was counterbalanced by lots of people telling me that I could do whatever I I know I chose to do, um, or maybe it was because there were uh, there were other stories where where girls did do you know mm. um, other things, and and that's there in the in in the teenage in literature that you come come and I you know and, and Judy Bloom is 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 definitely in there, and and like you, Judy Bloom opened all sorts of doors in terms of just understanding things that in a, in a way that I would never ever yeah. have understood <laughs> yeah. otherwise and no, no one had ever spoken about things in, in quite that way before and it's it, it feels so important and equally important now I think um, mm. as it as it as it did then um, yeah there's still relatively little honest talk about adolescence especially for girls I don't really know about boys stuff to be honest um, considering how long she's been yeah. you know, how long ago she pioneered the way mm -hmm. um, which I think shows that we're just still as a you know, bigger culture very very opposed to yeah. speaking honestly and and we, we and scabrously to girls and particularly when it comes to a, you know a book like for, forever and mm. and um, it it still feels like something that um, in, in in some ways seems to be taboo breaking now mm. to have a book where you, uh, where a woman can in, of that age can enjoy having sex and then move on and it's all fine yeah. no no no, no kind of the boy talk about it quite openly yeah. and then they decide to do it and it's a, it's a whole big thing it's a whole contextualized big um event yeah. and then yeah and they all survive and move on and yeah. it's not it's not the end of the story or the end of the world or anything it's yeah. just a part of life it's and it's still it still reads really Weirdly, and she wrote it in, it was published, first published in 1975, 
which blows my mind. Yeah. Because I think <laughs> I discovered it like every generation since yeah. I discovered sex itself. I think, you know, it, it came out just in time for me. Yes. <laughs> and given that up until then, most of my reading experience of sex came from Anya Seaton, which um, you is... You, Anya Seaton, uh, before, uh, before uh, adolescence, uh, well, uh, well done. Well, yeah, but not... It's, it's, I'm not sure those are lessons you need to be internalising, <laughs> really. Um, medieval romance is not, it's, it's it's not, not where it's anyone not, should be getting no, there. Um, so. Yeah. That's problematic. Too, it's, it, is very, it is yeah. very problematic. Um, and I, don't, I wanted to talk to you as well about Judith Kerr because, um, I mean, you, Judith Kerr, you mentioned with Marg and the Tiger Who Came to Tea, and then also with probably one of, one of my absolute all-time favourite books, which is When Hit the Stole Pink Rabbit, and the series of books that, that um, came after it. Um, do you want to talk about When Hit the Stole Pink Rabbit? I can't say much about it, to be honest, because uh, I had this edition as well. Um, I read it first at school, and I just read it once. I, I think I sort of sensed that there was much more going on that I didn't want to know and that it was absolutely horrible. I, I read mm. it, I was, at pro, I was at secondary school, so I must have been at least 11, 12. Mm. Um, I didn't know much about the Holocaust, apart from that a lot of people had died, I think. And, um, and I sort of put it, you know, if I'd been Joey, I'd put it in the freezer. <laughs> again. <laughs> um, and I didn't read it again. And now I can't read anything about the Holocaust, which is a great, you know, moral failing at the moment, but I just feel too sort of mm. fragile about the world and everything to, to read. So I didn't reread it for the book. Yeah. Um, but I read her autobiography, mm. which is just astounding. And the, you know, the background to it about her, her father uh, escaping Germany just mm. ahead of um, the people who were coming to get him, and you know, yeah. to kill him. Uh, and then the rest of the family following a little bit later and, and escaping to Switzerland mm. and then England, I think they went to America for a bit, mm. um, and her parents making it seem such an adventure that she was leaning out on a bal Paris balcony in one of their sort of staging post things, going, isn't it wonderful to be a refugee? <laughs> I mean, her parents must have gone in the background going, yes, we did it, and oh my God. Yeah. And she wrote this, of course, um, because Matthew, well, her children were watching The Sound of Music and went, oh, now I know what it must have been like for Mummy and her family. <laughs> yes, she was like, like, I'm not having this, <laughs> I can't have this. No. But she wrote this very, obviously, attenuated um, mm. uplifting ultimately version of what happened uh, to give them a truer but obviously still accessible mm. and, and not traumatising picture of what, what it was really like. Like you I found it when I, I, mean, I have read it several times but I, I found it disturbing when I first read it and I think it was one of the first books that I read where I was aware that the, a book could be telling two stories at once mm. and it could have a surface layer and then something underneath so yeah. that you were aware of another story that wasn't being told um and that was just always there it's in the just, background yeah. as like a, a, a shadow just hinted at for yeah it just lead you it's the next sort of half link in the chain um, that will lead um, you to proper knowledge yeah and that's there in, in zed for zachariah as well which mm. you which you also mentioned which was one of those books that uh, you got out from the school library i think and and i also got my copy from this from the school library so it was one of those books that one of the the definitely a book that i chose to read it was not no one yeah. no one handed it to me i i chose it for myself um horrifying horrifying oh. book <laughs> you don't get it. it's not as I bad mean, as brother in the land brother in the land just about destroyed me <laughs> just about destroyed me <laughs> fortunately i'd borrowed it from a friend and i was able to keep giving it back to her oh, and then having to get it out again and going i'm just going to give it one more i've got to i've got to get used to it. i've got to assimilate and get on top of this horror otherwise it's going to eat me up from the inside <laughs> it's a bad business yes nuclear war we sit yes. down <laughs> yeah yeah, but that's one, of, and that's one of those books as well where the um, I now I I I did come back to it later on, and I I, I didn't reread it before before this, but um, I remember my second reading of it as an adult being very different from from the way that I read it as a as a teenager, and seeing all kinds of even more terrifying things in it as an adult than I'd, I'd seen <laughs> when I first read it. A little knowledge is is actually quite a protective thing, I think. Once yes. you come back to a lot of these in, as an adult, it's it's. You're like, oh my God, how did this not break me yes. as a child? <laughs> and it's because you, know, you, you, you didn't, you couldn't appreciate it all and you had that innocence to mm. protect you. And you also write about books that are no longer, the, the sadness of books that are no longer in print. <laughs> I know, well, the first time I came across this ridiculous phenomenon, I think all books <laughs> should be in print yeah. all the time, obviously, uh, was um, a teacher read to us Phantom Tollbooth when we were about eight or nine primary school 
and I loved it. I mean, who wouldn't love mm -hmm. Phantom Tollbooth in Dictionopolis and, and uh, whatever the maths what was called? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what's called Digitopolis. Yeah. Uh, and so I went, Dad, Dad, please can we go to Dylan's in Bromley and, and get the Phantom Tollbooth? And so sat next Saturday we went off. And they lived up in this thing called a computer, it's a big grey box uh, this size. I went, no, no, it's out of print. And I was like, what does that mean? Yeah. I don't. Because I thought, you know, like I thought about banks, still think about banks and mm. newspapers. I thought they were just there. Uh, and he said, no, there's, you can't get it, it's, it's gone. You missed mm. it. <laughs> what? Uh, and it was true because there was no internet then and we didn't really do, I don't know, if, I don't know why we didn't do second-hand bookshop, bookshops, but there weren't any locally maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that was it. That was it for years and years and years and years, that was it. Mm -hmm. And then again, uh, you know, literally years later, Fontana bought out an, a new paper bag. But it wasn't the same edition as we read, but I grabbed it and I've got about seven editions now <laughs> as a hedge against further <laughs> loss and disappointment. But that feels like a good, in, you know, a, a good uh, investment. Yeah, um, are the books that I you... I don't regret it. Are the books that you would, you are keen to see come back into print with particular things that you would love to see come back? Yes, I'd like to see Gwen Grant's Private Keep Out and the two sequels come back into print. The, the first one was in print briefly uh, a few years ago by Barn Owl Books, but I don't think it is anymore. But there are the stirrings afoot, so yeah. I'll keep oh, you posted. Uh, and a wonderful book called Life with Lisa by Sybil Burr, who was an adult sort of potboiler novelist at the time, but wrote, wrote this great, and again, very funny book for sort of 11, mm -hmm. 10, 11 year olds uh, about this uh, secondary modern schoolgirl called Lisa who discovers peeps, or pe um, she spells it P-E-E-P, -E -E -P. he spelt it wrong on the front of his book, but what can you do, yeah, no. he's dead now, um, and is determined to make a success of her life, even though she has gone to the second one, so it's all randomly but beautifully capitalised to mm. make it funny, and she is just alive, what and a, a phenomenal heroine, and I love her, and I want to see that back in print. Well, thank you so much, and thank you for this absolutely beautiful book and it is, be oh, absolutely it is beautiful absolutely beautiful it, yeah, it really really cover. is beautiful and um i think anybody who has ever loved a book actually will love this book because oh, it just I, so. I think it it's just like being put in a in a time capsule back to your own childhood and reminded of all the books you well i hope it finds its tribe. And do love. Yeah, yeah i think i think it will do thank, thank you, you.